Hello, my name is Stefan, and today I'll be giving you a uh, introduction, a window into the topic of de-randomization. So, random algorithms are crucial in computer science uh, for building efficient algorithms. And a common question one can ask is, well, if I have an efficient random algorithm, uh, maybe it's possible that I could convert it into an efficient deterministic algorithm. So this is what's known as de-randomization. And the crucial question in the field is whether P equals BPP. So P is our traditional class of polytime algorithms, and BPP will be our class of polytime random algorithms, which I'll formally define soon. Uh, but first, let me give an informal description of a randomized algorithm. Uh, so a randomized algorithm, or rather an efficient one, so uh, it will run in polynomial time, and will have access to polynomially many coin flips to generate randomness. Now to formally define this, one would appeal to probabilistic Turing machines, uh, but for that I leave it to uh, standard texts on the subject. Uh, so let's begin with defining our first complexity class, RP. So RP will be the set of all languages L, uh, such that uh, there is some randomized algorithm, some polytime uh, randomized algorithm, uh, such that the following holds such that the probability that A on input X uh, is correct, given X is in your language, uh, this will be greater or equal to two-thirds, and the probability that A of X is correct, given X is not in your language, uh, this will equal one. So what does this mean? This means that in RP we have one-sided error, so there is never any false positives. So whenever x is not in the language, our algorithm will correctly say that it is not in the language, no matter how the coin flips uh, happen. Whereas if x is in the language, our algorithm might actually be incorrect with probability less than a third. Okay, so this is RP, which is our set of efficient one-sided random algorithms. Now let me actually give you a second definition, which is important, and which we will appeal to for the rest of this presentation. So let's define it over here. RP is the set of all uh, languages L, uh, such that uh, there is a Turing machine. So this Turing machine is our standard deterministic Turing machine. M on our input x and some random pad r. So um, x has n bits and l um, or r has uh, polynomially uh, many bits on m. So r is a blank p of n for some polynomial p. Uh, then again we go through these probabilities. The probability that uh, m on xr uh, is correct, uh, given x is in L, uh, this is greater or equal to two-thirds, and the probability that mxr is correct, uh, given x is not in the language, uh, this is 1. Right, because we are one-sided, so no false positives. So these are two equivalent definitions, and we'll be appealing to this one mostly. And so here we have a, a deterministic machine, and uh, the input is fixed, and then we can randomly choose some extra input, which will be our coin flips. Okay, so this is RP, uh, but we're going to give a more general class now called BPP, which contains RP. So BPP uh, is two-sided error, so it may actually have false positives. 
So how will we rewrite this? It'll have some ran uh, polytime randomized algorithm uh, such that the probability that it's correct is simply greater or equal to two thirds. So this, uh, it may be wrong if X is not in the language, it may be wrong if X is in the language, uh, but it is right with probability greater or equal to two thirds. And we can also change this definition as well. So the probability that M on X and R is correct is simply greater than two thirds. So our goal is to try and figure out how we can change some language L in BPP uh, to something in P. And this will be the direction we take for the rest of the talk. Now, before that, I need to discuss some basic facts about BPP. Uh, firstly, note the two thirds. Uh, two thirds itself is actually arbitrary. Uh, we can replace this with anything that is one half plus some epsilon. Uh, now, why is that? Uh, so, given some uh, algorithm in BPP, we can run it polynomially many times and take the majority of the outputs. And uh, by Chernoff's bound, this actually shows that you can uh, convert the error to something that is exponentially small. Uh, and this is as long as you have some correctness probability that's greater than a half. So whether it's a half plus uh, epsilon or two thirds, whatever, uh, you can always boost it uh, by rerunning the algorithm polynomially many times and decreasing the error to something that's exponentially small. Okay, so now let's talk about our first theorem on BPP. So theorem, and this is by Edelman, and it is that BPP has poly-sized circuits. Okay. Uh, so this is interesting because uh, poly-sized circuits has nothing to do uh, with randomness. So now we are finally able to relate randomness to complexity classes we know about. All right, so let's prove this. Okay. Uh, so by our definition uh, of BPP, uh, we know uh, that the probability uh, that, so probability over some random pad R, that MXR uh, is incorrect. Uh, so this probability, uh, we can set it less than or equal to 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 uh, by that uh, rerunning procedure I just described, uh, rerunning and taking the majority. So we can set it to something that's exponentially small in our input size. Okay, uh, well, if this is the case, then by union bound, uh, we can say that the probability for R that there is some input X where M, X, R uh, is incorrect. Uh, this will be less than or equal to 2 to the n over 2 to the n plus 1, which of course equals 1 half, which is less than 1. So what does this mean? It means that the probability, if you choose some random uh, pad r, uh, the probability that there is something that's incorrect on is less than 1. Uh, this implies that there exists some random pad R that is correct for every input in our input space of uh, 0, 1 uh, to the n, uh, which is great uh, because that will be our polynomially sized advice we will give showing containment in p-poly. So take R such that mxr correct uh, for all x. Um, as your advice. And this shows that we are in p-poly. Now, in my opinion, this, this theorem, or the proof of this theorem, really shows uh, why randomness is so frustrating. Because if it was uh, polynomially 
if, if we in deterministic polynomial time could compute this r, then obviously we have a, a fully deterministic algorithm uh, for things in BPP. You just compute this r, uh, which we know has to exist and works for every input. Uh, so if there were some way to determine this r uh, easily, then this field would be nothing. But it is in fact hard to do. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, let me describe another theorem, but I won't actually prove this one. So this is a theorem uh, due to Sipser Lautman. And this one will relate BPP to the polytime hierarchy. So specifically, uh, BPP is a subset of uh, the second level of our polytime hierarchy. So sigma 2 intersect uh, pi 2. OK. Uh, so the way uh, that you prove such a thing is because it, well, it's easily seen that BPP is closed under complement, all you have to do is show that there is some statement in sigma 2 uh, that describes BPP, and this automatically gives a statement in pi 2, and so it'll be in the intersection. Okay, so while I won't show you Lautman's proof of this, I will at least show you the sigma 2 uh, description he gave. So the sigma 2 description he gave was there exists T1, T2, up to uh, T, P of N, uh, such that for any random pad R, uh, then the following is true. So this disjunction of uh, running uh, your machine M on X and R translated by uh, Ti, Uh, so this will be true if uh, x is in your language, which is in BPP. So here we have our there exists for all statement, so it is in sigma 2. So what this sort of leads to is uh, the following desire. Well, here we have polynomially many translates, which essentially encapsulate the entire space of the, our random pads. Uh, one of these has to be true if uh, x is in our language. OK, so then maybe our goal should be finding some small set, some polynomially sized set, such that if you run the algorithm on one of those pads, it has to return uh, true on, on one of these pads. And this is actually the exact direction we will now take. Okay, so now I'm going to define what's known as a hitting set generator. Okay, so heading set generator G uh, will be given uh, some N S in unary uh, will output a set of strings. So we'll output some set uh, G on N S uh, such that any circuit of size S that accepts at least half its inputs must accept on uh, one of these strings. So let me write that, so such that any circuit size uh, less than S that accepts uh, greater than half the inputs, uh, so, what, uh, so you'll have there exists some element in your heading set. 
uh, where this algorithm accepts. So we'll call it M, so M on G accepts. Okay, so it's pretty clear that if, if a hitting set generator, generator exists, then we have an easy way to de-randomize RP, our one-sided error. Uh, so why is that? So if, uh, if you have a problem that's an RP, um, then simply uh, take a hitting set generator on uh, size S such that uh, that can implement your problem, and then just use these Gs as your random pads, and one of them will have to accept. Uh, this is true because in RP you have to at least have your inputs accepting, and um, in this case, uh, yes, so we, we have half our inputs accepting, and so then in RP all we have to do is use uh, our hitting set as random pads, and if one of them uh, gives a yes, uh, then we accept. And this works because we have one-sided error, there's no false positives. Unfortunately, it's not clear, given a hitting set gender generator, uh, how we can use it to uh, de-randomize uh, BPP, uh, because we have two-sided error. So if we simply use the hitting set um, as our random pads for a problem in BPP, uh, because we're allowed false positives, it might not necessarily uh, give you the right answer if just one of them uh, accepts. So the rest of this talk is to figure out a way on given a hitting set generator how to de-randomize BPP. Okay. So here we have, uh, we'll have our main theorem, so our theorem, Michael Reich, uh, et al. Uh, given hitting set gener generator, I'm going to initialize this as HG, uh, HSG, uh, G, uh, that runs in time TG, uh, then BPP is a subset of uh, deterministic time poly of TG of poly of N. Okay. So this is what we will prove. Now first, uh, let me define uh, the de-randomization procedure that we'll be using. Okay. So here's our procedure. So step one, uh, well first let's uh, define everything. So we'll have our algorithm A on input X and random pad R. Okay. And we'll say that this is implementable on circuits of size S. Size S. And we'll say that R uh, is bounded by a polynomial L. So uh, the length of R is some polynomial L on the input size. Okay, and we'll hold these definitions for the rest of the talk. So step one is uh, assuming that a hitting set generator exists, uh, then uh, we'll define G to be our hitting set gen generator on parameters uh, L and L times S. Okay. So we assume this uh, exists. And uh, so let's call, uh, let's say that this set equals H, and let's say that the size of H uh, equals N, and uh, let's also define all the inputs of H. So let's say that E1, E2, up to EN 
are uh, the elements of H. Okay. So now, let's define uh, the following matrix. So I'm going to have this matrix M indexed by these hitting set elements. And that coordinate IJ uh, will have this equal to A of X on EI X or uh, EJ. So the result of our algorithm on input X and the XOR of these two elements in our hitting set. Okay, so we formally define this algorithm in polynomial time, or well, this matrix in polynomial time. And then finally, uh, we have, we define two following cases. So show that either uh, for every uh, L columns, Uh, C1 to CL, uh, there exists a row R uh, such that M on R CI is 1. Uh, and uh, so this is one case. And then the other case will be that for every L call, uh, every L rows, uh, there exists uh, a column R, uh, C, a column C, uh, such that the matrix on uh, rows R, I, and C, uh, these all equal zero. Okay, so this is our full procedure. And so really the, the magic happens in step three. Well, assuming that a hitting set generator exists, so what we need to show is that exactly one of these two cases hold, and not only that, that we can find out in polynomial time on uh, the running time of the hitting set generator. Okay, uh, so let's do that. Okay, so first, I'm simply going to show that one of these two cases always has to happen. So lemma level one. Um, if x is in your language, then uh, I'm going to change these to a and b. Then 3a is true. And uh, if x is not in your language, uh, then 3b is true. Okay, so let's recap. If x is in your language, then that means, uh, well, we're going to show that that implies that there exists, uh, well, that for every L columns, uh, there must be a row where all those columns have a 1 on that row. And likewise, if x is not in our language, uh, then we must have 3b is true. So there must, for every L rows, there must be a column where in the matrix, all those rows have a zero on that column. Okay. Uh, so we're actually going to show something a bit more general. Uh, we're going to show that, uh, so first, uh, let's say that this uh, is the characteristic function of our language. So this returns 1 if x is in the language and 0 if x is not in the language. Okay. Uh, so we're going to show something a bit more general. So uh, we'll show that for every uh, L rows, our uh, respectively columns, uh, there exists a column, or respectively a row, uh, such that the matrix on, uh, on these L rows, 
So our i c equals uh, the characteristic function. And respectively for uh, swapping these for columns in a row. Okay, so it's easy to see that this, this is a more general statement. So clearly, um, if x is in the language, then this is 1. So then uh, that will be the case that for every l columns, there exists a, a row such that um, uh, all on that row, those columns are 1. And then we have this case um, if x is not in the language. Okay, so let's proceed. Okay, so first let me define a new circuit for you. So let's say that C of X on R uh, returns A on input X and random pad R. Okay, so one thing to note here is that our circuit um, has size less than S. Uh, and that's simply because A has a circuit that's size uh, less than S. So size of Cx is less than or equal to S. Okay. So simply by definition, um, and uh, I, I forgot to mention, let me also uh, claim, so let's set our error. Um, so suppose our error uh, for our, our algorithm A is 1 over 2L, so error a is less than or equal to 1 over 2L. Again, we can make this true simply by running A polynomially many times and taking the majority. Okay. So this will be our error of A. So then by our choice of this error, uh, we'll have that the probability, uh, given some random pad R, Um, that C of X on R um, disagrees with the characteristic function, uh, this will have probability less than our error, 1 over 2L. Okay, um, so now suppose that I take any L uh, random pads, so let Y1 uh, up to y l uh, be random pads. Okay. Then uh, if we take the union bound of this and take the complement, we have the following true. So the probability um, So the probability that uh, for every i, uh, cx of y, i, s or z uh, equals the characteristic function, uh, this will be greater or equal to one half. Right, so this is simply by doing the union bound of uh, this inequality and then taking the complement to switch uh, the inequality to a, an equality. Okay, so great. Uh, so now, uh, using this definition, uh, or this fact, I'm going to define um, a circuit Cx y bar on z, which will uh, just be the conjunction of if Cx on uh, y, i, x, or z equals the characteristic function. Okay. So if for every uh, y, i, and y, um, the shift of y, i with z uh, gives the correct um, containment of x in our language, uh, then this will output 1. Um, and if just a single yi is wrong, uh, then this will output uh, zero. Now, by this inequality we have here, we know that uh, the probability that all of them 
give the containment uh, is at least one half. So this means that our circuit uh, accepts on at least half of its inputs, right? Uh, that's simply because we have a prob probability greater than half that all these things are true, uh, which would imply uh, that this gives a one, so it accepts. Okay, so this means that C x y accepts at least half its inputs. Great. Uh, now, also recall that circuit CX has size at most S. Um, so this means that CX Y bar uh, will have size at most L times S. So size at most L times S. Well, if you recall by the definition of a hitting set generator, uh, so we have a hitting set generator here uh, that will take in an input of uh, size L, and if it's implementable on a circuit of size uh, L times S, uh, there must exist uh, something in your hitting set which gives the correct answer. Okay, so uh, what does this mean? Since we have this hitting set generator here, uh, this means that there's a, there exists a Z Uh, such that Cx of yi x or z equals our characteristic function uh, for every i. Well, this is exactly what we wanted um, in case b, right? Uh, or rather, in, in this case up here. So uh, if you take in our matrix m, the column indexed by z, then that column um, on all these rows, uh, yi, uh, that will, will equal uh, the characteristic function of the language on x. So take z as column in m. OK? And you can do this respectively for, uh, for all columns that exists a row. The proof is the exact same. And uh, this shows this more general statement, which in turn implies uh, what we need, that at least one of these two things is true, right? Because always either x is in the language or x is not in the language. OK, so great, we have lemma one. So at least one of these two things is true. Now, uh, we also need to show that at most one of these two things is true. Okay, so let's try and prove that. So first I need to give um, a technical lemma, which I'll prove later. So let's call this lemma two. And so lemma two says on an arbitrary Boolean matrix, so Boolean uh, matrix B of uh, dimensions n by n, uh, either uh, there exists uh, k, well, so uh, for all k greater than log two then plus one, um, either there exists uh, k rows uh, such that their disjunction, their bitwise uh, disjunction is all ones. All right, so what this means is if, if you have a matrix and you have k rows, uh, you take the disjunction of all these rows and we want this to be all ones. And so what that, of course, means is that there has to be a one in every column here. And so the other case is that there will exist k columns uh, such that their bitwise conjunction uh, 
is the all zeros. Okay, so uh, note that this is for any Boolean matrix. Okay, so given this, can we show that at most one of these two cases is true? Um, in fact, yes, we can. So corollary. Uh, so the corollary is that most one of these two things is true, right? So uh, suppose that uh, suppose that there exists k rows such that their bitwise disjunction is all ones. Uh, let's call this one. Let's call this two. So suppose uh, one. Okay, well, we have k rows. Uh, their bitwise disjunction is the all ones. Uh, so this is all ones. Uh, now, is it possible that we could have a column uh, that is all zeros? Well, no, because if we had a column that's all zeros, then this would be a zero here, but we need this to be all ones. So if one is true, then we can't have 3b. Uh, and similarly, if you suppose the second option here, there, there are k columns where their bitwise conjunction is all zeros, uh, you'll get that you can't have 3a. OK, uh, great. So a corollary of this lemma is that at most, one of these two things is true. <clears throat> All right, so assuming that this lemma is true, let's concoct the proof of the main lemma. Our main theorem, rather. Okay, so uh, by the lemma I just erased, by lemma 1, um, 1 of 3a or 3b has to be true, or at least 1. Of 3a, uh, 3b, true. Okay. And by the corollary of lemma 2, at most one of them is true. By the corollary. OK, so now we just need to determine which one is true. And we do that by determining which one of 1 and 2 is. So now let me add that. Uh, to this lemma, we also can figure out which one of 1 or 2 is in polynomial time. We can find out which in uh, poly time. So since we can find out which uh, happens in poly time, we know uh, which of these is possible. Uh, and we're guaranteed that one of these is possible by lemma 1. Uh, and we're done. That's the proof of the theorem. Uh, it's true by corollary. Find which in poly time. And that's it. All right. So given our hitting set uh, generator, uh, we, we have our first two steps of building that matrix. That's in polynomial time. Uh, then in polynomial time, we determine which of these two cases is true, which in turn uh, determines uh, the membership of X in our language. Okay. So now all that remains is proving lemma 2. This technical lemma on Boolean matrices. So let's do that. <clears throat> Uh, proof of lemma 2. Uh, 
Uh, so the interesting thing here is that it's a greedy algorithm, a, a naive greedy algorithm that will run in polynomial time. So uh, first we're going to set out on a quest to look for these k rows. So let's uh, start with a set of rows. So let's say R is the empty, empty set, and let's say we're beginning with a set of all the columns in our matrix. Okay, here's how the algorithm goes visually. So, uh, we, uh, we, let's, let's just start with our step one. Uh, we have all our columns available. Uh, we're going to look for a row that has at least half uh, ones in the available columns. So we're going to look for a row I'll just call it R1, uh, that has uh, C0 over 2, or greater than C0 over 2 ones. Okay. Uh, so let for now, let's just suppose that such a row exists. Okay. Uh, well then, uh, let's refine uh, C0. So then let, let's uh, then call uh, C1 to be all the columns uh, where this is a 0. Okay, so that means all the remaining columns are 1s. Ones. So now we're honing in on the ones that were 0. Notice that uh, by this condition that at least half of the columns have a 1, uh, that we've reduced the number of uh, columns. So C0 going to C1 um, has half as many columns remain. We reduce this uh, number of columns by half, at least. Okay, so we repeat this process over and over again. So then we find an R2 uh, where it has at least uh, C1 over 2, so uh, greater than C1 over 2 ones in C1. So now we're focusing on uh, C1, which is these three columns. Uh, so let's say we have 1, 1, 0. So then we, again, same process, refine it to uh, so this would be our C2, the, the columns remaining that were zeros for this row. Okay, so then this, uh, this would be C2, and, and so on. And suppose you do this until you run out of columns, uh, so you never get stuck. Uh, well, then this means that uh, we for every column, we found a row that has a 1 in it, because we remove a column when we find such a row that has a 1 in it. So if we repeat this procedure until no columns are remaining, uh, that means that we have satisfied uh, our first condition uh, here, that there exists k rows uh, such that their bitwise disjunction is the all ones. Because all we require is that in one of the rows, uh, there's a 1 for each column. OK, so formally, I'll erase this matrix now and write the procedure formally. So for step i, uh, find row ri in the remaining rows that we haven't chosen, uh, such that Uh, on this row and um, in our remaining columns uh, has uh, so has at least C size of CI minus 1 over 2 ones so this row uh, has at least uh, has ones on at least half the remaining columns and if if you can repeat this until there are no columns remaining, as I just said, uh, condition one holds, and we're done. 
Uh, and this is also because uh, we're reducing the solution space by half each time. Uh, so that means that we'll find something bounded by log, which is what we want. Okay, uh, but what happens if you get stuck? So what does this mean? So say we get stuck at step i. So let's call S to be CI. Uh, this means that every row has uh, at least size of S over two uh, zeros in it, uh, because otherwise we could have continued with finding uh, another row. So for every row, uh, R has at least size of s over two zeros um, in columns s. And notice this is for every row, not just the, the rows not in R. Uh, this is because uh, rows in R um, have zeros on all of these columns. Uh, otherwise, uh, the column wouldn't have stayed in CI. Uh, and uh, all the remaining rows that are not in R must have at least s over two zeros, otherwise we could have chosen another row and repeated this procedure. Okay, now uh, we can sort of do a dual procedure to what we just did, um, except with uh, columns instead of rows. Okay, so now uh, we're going to have uh, So now we have, let's say, r um, i uh, equals n, and we'll start with c being the empty set. So notice how we've sort of flipped around our situation here. And uh, for step i, uh, select a column C for, um, in S, um, in S minus uh, C, uh, such that uh, C has, or well, such that C maximizes the number of available zeros. Number of zeros um, in R uh, I minus one. Okay. All uh, right. So th this is sort of yeah the exact reverse of here. Uh, so notice that uh, this set S. Uh, there might be a lot of things in here, but if we take the conjunction of S, uh, then we are going to get the all zero column. Why? Uh, well, simply because we, we must have for every row that it has at least, um, well, it has at least one zero. So if you take the disjunction, the, uh, the conjunction, you'll get the all zeros column. Okay? So um, we have to now argue that we can only, we can select a logarithmic number of columns in S uh, that also gives a conjunction of zero. Okay? So we're almost there. Now all I need to mention is that, uh, so given uh, our i, uh, by, by this condition we already have on s, uh, we know that on our submatrix, um, our i by S minus C, um, there are at least um, size of R I times size of S minus C um, over two uh, zeros, right? Just by that fact. Well, then by pigeonhole principle, I can always find a column that has at least 
um, uh, half the zeros on the rows. So by pigeonhole, uh, there exists some C and S C such that um, uh, it has a size of Ri, well, at least size of Ri over two zeros on rows Ri. So this shows that by repeating this procedure, um, we only have to do it logarithmically many times, just as we had over here, um, in order to get all the rows. And we'll never get stuck, unlike here, because we're guaranteed to have all these zeros. So you can always find this desirable column. So uh, the full algorithm goes, uh, run this procedure on the rows. If you're not stuck and you uh, empty out all the columns, then you found your k rows. However, if you do get stuck, then uh, go over to the column side uh, with this set s and uh, generate your set of columns. And all of this is doable in polynomial time, simply because all you're doing is searching your matrix polynomially many times. And that's the proof of lemma two. Uh, so to recap, uh, we developed this uh, procedure for any language in BPP, uh, such that we, we build this matrix M, and then we know that two cases on that matrix are true. And by this uh, lemma on Boolean matrices, we were able to determine which of those cases were true, and those cases themselves implied membership or non-membership in our language. Uh, so given this magical hitting, hitting set generator we use, uh, we have this determinant or we have this deterministic procedure. So if our hitting set generator ran in polynomial time, then that means this whole procedure that we just developed also would have run in polynomial time. And that's the proof. Well, thank you for listening.